نور تو بر ما فرستی نور تو ای جان ار محجور تو جان را خلامت می کنم من آینه دل راز تو اینجا سقالی می دهم من گوش خود را دفتر لطف کلامت می کنم در گوش تو در هوش تو و در دل پر جوش تو در گوش تو در هوش تو و در دل پر جوش تو این ها چه باشد تو منی و این وصف آمد می کنم ای دل نعن در ماجرا می گفت آن دل بر تو را هرچند از تو کم شود از خود تمامت می کنم ای چاره در من چاره در حیران شو و نزاره در بنگر که از این جمله سوار این دم کدومت می کنم گراست ماننده الف گه کش چو حرف مختلف یک لحظه پخته می شوی یک لحظه خامت می کنم گر سال ها ره می روی چون مهره در دست من گر سال ها ره می روی چون مهره در دست من چیزی که رامش می کنی سان چیز رامت می کنم Uh, hello again. Welcome to round two of the discussion about ISIS presence in Afghanistan. Uh, the fall of northern Iraq uh, uh, to a group then was called Islamic State of Iraq and Sham, the dramatic gains of the group in Syria, the proclamation of the Islamic State, and then the mass execution, women enslavement, and sectarian killings was among the main uh, events of the 2014, 2015, 2016, the of the so-called uh, Islamic State uh, reached beyond the Middle East. Uh, it had particular significance uh, for Afghanistan and entire South Asia. Uh, for reasons, uh, this round table want to make, uh, as I said before, in this round table, we have distinguished uh, wise experts, which I want to introduce, Mr. Tamim Osi, YWSP, uh, former Deputy Defense Minister of Afghanistan, uh, Mr. Kabir Nejja, uh, member of a think tank based in New Delhi, India, and Mr. Aryan Sharifi, uh, former uh, threat assessment uh, expert in uh, National Security Council of Afghanistan. Uh, welcome, dear panelists, in this roundtable discussion. Uh, I want to uh, begin with uh, Mr. Tamim Osi, uh, Deputy uh, Defense Minister of, uh, former Deputy Defense Minister of Afghanistan. Uh, in uh, 2000, Mr. Osi, in 2000, I think, uh, Islamic State established its Khorasan province in eastern Kunar and Ningarhar provinces of Afghanistan, but they suffered a military defeat. And their safe houses, even in Kabul, uh, 
eliminated by security forces. But despite their military defeat, they pose security threat to big cities like Kabul, even today. Why? Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, AISS, uh, for organizing this uh, very good panel. And it's a pleasure to share this panel with very distinguished panelists, um, my former colleague and friend, Dr. Aryan Sharifi, and Kabir Taneja, um, uh, my good friend. Let me start um, by, um, I'll be very brief, and um, uh, let me start by giving an outline of how I'm going to answer your question. Um, the, the first is, is a general outlook of ISIS, what I call, um, or Daesh ISKP, or uh, ISKP Khurasan, you know, different uh, terminologies which are out there. Um, first, I see a resurgence of ISIS across uh, the board, uh, in ICE uh, Central, as well as ICE Wilayat uh, Khurasan. And I fear uh, that um, we are going to see an ISKP version 2.0, um, uh, the resurgence of that. Uh, and uh, the reason why I say that is um, for, there are three factors uh, playing uh, for, this for this resurgence. Uh, the first factor is uh, the Afghan peace process. Uh, the Afghan peace process is uh, pushing a lot of Taliban uh, extremist Taliban to change uh, flags and um, fill in the ranks of the uh, of the ISKP, which is a very appealing. This reason I see uh, the factor that is driving it is um, the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, I think COVID-19 is playing uh, an important uh, role in radicalizing. Uh, both from a cyber perspective as well as on the ground realities, specifically hunger, poverty, and other things, uh, are uh, driving people um, on the uh, to the embrace of Daesh um, and ISKP. The third reason is uh, that when the Afghan government announced, or the third factor for this resurgence is that when the Afghan government announced that they defeated Daesh in Nangarhar, that was one of the battlefields that they won, but the job wasn't finished. Um, they did not deal with the uh, sleeper cells uh, of, of ISKP, uh, what I call the urban-centric um, uh, IS model or ISKP model. The urban sleeper cells were uh, still very active. The, there's also another factor which is worth mentioning is that the ISKP is increasingly becoming uh, an intelligence driven project. Uh, it is, it is uh, turning it into, 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 into an intelligence false flag uh, uh, intelligence project by various intelligence, regional intelligence agencies, which uses them to uh, legitimize um, their proxies. I, I believe that is the reason why we see a resurgence of an ISKP, maybe version 2.0. Thank you, Mr. Rossi. Mr. Bhattija, some people say that uh, uh, Indian establishment believes that ISKP in Afghanistan is big. It does not represent IS Central. It is another proxy of the ISI. Is it true? Uh, it's uh, well, uh, if you see a lot of studies that have been done in the recent past, uh, uh, including by Antonio Di Sozi, who's uh, from Europe, and by your institute, and, and so on, and we see the recent arrests made uh, after the Gurdwara attack in Kabul, I think it's fairly clear that uh, there is a strong sort of Pakistan hand involved in it now. And it's not uh, necessary that it's the entire ISK or uh, Islamic State in uh, Khorasan that is, uh, as an umbrella organization, involved uh, uh, with Pakistan. I think Pakistan has managed to, uh, as it happens, uh, uh, managed to buy the loyalties of some of the people involved in the umbrella organization, which is ISK. And, um, uh, and, these, uh, and these people have also got uh, differences with uh, other ISK members who are not very happy about this, uh, this outreach that the Pakistanis have done and the Pakistan Intelligence Agency has done 
uh, within the ISK uh, brand. Uh, so I think that's fairly that's fairly clear now. It's not uh, it's not a one-off uh, report that has come that uh, the ISI has had a hand in, uh, if not <coughs> building, but in the um, uh, uh, the ranks of, of the ISK and uh, it being able to sort of buy some of the people off uh, in, in, and get them into their content. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Aryan Sharifi. It seems that the United States and Russia, also in the same page, they both believe that the ISKP is a uh, big threat. Uh, in your opinion, what's the cause of the uh, reinsurgence of the ISKP? Oh, well, thank you. Uh, Mr. Rossi mentioned three main reasons, and uh, I think those uh, three, three reasons are very convincing. And, and very important. Please allow me to add uh, five more reasons to it, to that list. Um, well, first of all, if you look at the history of ISKP in Afghanistan, it actually shows you that successively, despite heavy military pressure upon it by the Afghan government, by the coalition forces, and in fact, uh, in Eastern Afghanistan, even the infighting between the Taliban and ISK uh, still, the organization has been able to not only survive, but also to thrive. So, so the history uh, is number one. It's, it's, uh, the, the roots are very strong, and it's continued to survive uh, in spite of severe military pressure. Number two is the issue of ideology. And I believe that, uh, uh, that uh, the ISK ideology does have some resonance um, uh, within certain segments of the population here. And if you can look at the, uh, uh, some of the recruitment centers they have, uh, it's within mostly within, uh, within the universities and educational centers. So the ideology of ISKP that uh, uh, it has some resonance among certain segments of the population in the, in the region, not only in Afghanistan, but also in the region. Um, number three is, uh, Again, the issue of peace processes, Mr. Rossi also uh, mentioned with the Taliban that, uh, you know, the more we advance on the peace process, even uh, um, the, the, the commencement of the peace process itself has had some impact uh, on the survivability of ISKP, uh, mainly because uh, uh, a good number of the Taliban in various parts of the, the country uh, have switched sides and have joined uh, ISKP uh, thinking that the peace might work with the Taliban and the Taliban might just uh, uh, cease to be an insurgent group anymore. But there are certain individuals, uh, perhaps even mid-level commanders who still believe for various reasons, maybe ideological reasons, maybe uh, even financial, economic, political reasons, uh, that they still want to continue the fight. So ISKP is an uh, outlet for them through which they can, um, they can uh, continue their fight. Reason number four is that there are uh, a number of other terrorist groups that are not actually Afghan here, uh, but they use Afghan territory as a staging uh, ground to uh, stage, plan, and conduct attacks uh, across the region. We have a number of Pakistani groups here. We have uh, a number of uh, regional terrorist groups, including the uh, ETIM, uh, the IMU, we have uh, Ansar Allah, we have Jundullah, at least four main regional terrorist groups that operate in Afghanistan, uh, and they're not Afghan. Uh, they used to be uh, allied with the Taliban, they perhaps might even be at, uh, as we speak, but they are looking into another outlet. If the peace process works with the Taliban, they need another ally, another outlet through which they can continue the fight. And uh, finally, as again, as Mr. Rossi mentioned, uh, it is an intelligence uh, um, uh, project. There are certain uh, actors in the region that have been using terrorist groups uh, as a proxy force uh, in the war in Afghanistan. And uh, those states, the strategic environment for those states have not changed. And so if the Taliban are going to come and uh, join the peace process with the Afghan government, then they need another proxy to fill in. And, and ISK is a good candidate. Thank you, uh, Mr. Rossi. As you mentioned, the commencement of the uh, peace talks between the U.S. and the Taliban is part of the problem. It attracted some Taliban fighters to ISIL. But uh, Mr. Uh, Zalmay Khalilzad, chief negotiator of Washington, said, says repeatedly that uh, 
the political settlement is the solution. Political settlement in Afghanistan will, dis will destroy the ISIS. What's your opinion? Mr. Khalilzad has a mission to deliver on, and um, he's uh, career driven, so uh, good for him. Uh, we live in the reality here in Afghanistan, and we are at the receiving end of the bombs and the car bombs and everything else. And the US has rightly so a, an election year, and Mr. Khalilzad is given a duty to deliver um, an electoral promise uh, by his bosses in the White House and the State Department. So that that's quite understand his point of view. But this country belongs to Afghans, and Afghans will decide uh, the fate of this country. Um, the United States has a national security priority or a, an electoral uh, priority, and they will do what they have to do, and we will do what we have to do. And uh, at our end, uh, what is required is, of course, we would like peace with the Taliban, but a dignified, sustainable peace, not a rush peace. In terms of um, the Daesh link to the Afghan peace process. Um, it has many layers. It's not really quite uh, black and white. Um, the first is the geopolitical landscape of this region. Um, the Daesh brand is used um, through various proxy forces um, to pressure the US, the Afghan government, uh, you know, other players um, uh, for, for a variety of political and military reasons. So Daesh is a very appealing brand to be used as a proxy uh, for geopolitical means, uh, ends rather. The second uh, layer that I see is uh, there is a, a, a jihadi ecosystem in this part of the world. And uh, certain countries are afraid uh, that uh, if they take on um, or, or if Afghanistan becomes peaceful, the war will come inside their geography. Uh, so they would rather continue this um, uh, fight or this war and then dump their problems in the Afghan geography. Um, and the final thing is that uh, the final reason I see uh, in terms of direct links between the Afghan peace process and the Daesh rise is uh, of course um, uh, the filling of the ranks of the Taliban of, of the Daesh uh, by disenchanted, you know, Taliban uh, foot soldiers as well as other groups, uh, so, uh, you know, uh, foot soldiers commanders. Uh, but there's also an enabling infrastructure in the neighborhood of Afghanistan. Um, no matter how many political settlements you reach, uh, if you don't address that enabling infrastructure. Um, uh, then you will continue uh, to have this war in, an, in one way uh, or shape or form or size. Uh, what you do is uh, you don't address the source, but you rather go and um, address uh, the, the causes. I mean, um, it's, it's, if you look at the number of um, uh, successes that the Afghan NDS had uh, in terms of arresting um, uh, successive uh, arresting or killing successive ISKP leaders and their uh, major commanders. They also put uh, ANDSF and the Afghan military has also put a lot of, um, uh, you know, pressure on the on on the uh, ISKP military machinery recently. But still, the ideological bed, as Mr. Sharif, Dr. Sh Dr. Aryan Sharif was mentioning, as well as the enabling infrastructure, is there, um, and they have also not addressed the. You know the urban branches of ISKP um, in Afghanistan. Um, so I see uh, that there, I see a direct link between the Afghan peace process and the, the ISKP project becoming bigger and bigger, uh, a more appealing brand, as well as um, you will see that the ISKP will become a, a bigger threat uh, 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 other than the Taliban. Um, in, in the coming days. Uh, I call that ISKP version 2.0, a resurgence. Um, but this will be a branch resurgence, not an, ISK, uh, an ISIS resurgence, um, uh, that uh, IS, ISIS central resurgence, but rather IS, ISKP Velayat or, or rather branch resurgence um, enabled or empowered or strengthened by a variety of sources, uh, intelligence money, intelligence projects, um, you know, as well as um, disenchanted extremist groups joining 
and the countries of the region dumping their experience in Afghanistan and continuing this war. Yeah, thank you. Can I just say, you mentioned before, Washington and Moscow consider uh, ISK to be a threat. Uh, what about India? Uh, is India feel threat from ISKP or not? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I think there are two, two ways that India currently looks at this right now. We had some people between 2014 and 2016 that actually managed to travel to Afghanistan to join the ISKP brand. And we saw that even uh, around the Gurdwara attack, where one of the people involved uh, by ISKP was an Indian national. So uh, there, there is a, there is a sense of uh, threat that India sees from ISKP uh, regarding its interest in, in 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 Afghanistan and regarding the Afghan people and government itself. Um, uh, it does see ISKP as a growing project that the Pakistan uh, military and the intelligence has against the Afghans itself and against the in goodwill that Indians and Afghans share with each other. So from that aspect, I think ISKP does pose, uh, pose a challenge for, for India and its uh, pluralistic thinking. But as far as from our geographic nature is concerned, I think ISKP has uh, come up uh, in many discussions and debates as far as Indian security uh, infrastructures are concerned. And the one place, of course, where a lot of issues are raised is Kashmir. Um, we saw over the past uh, 24 hours uh, of how uh, some fake news uh, coming up uh, between uh, uh, what the Taliban thinks about Kashmir uh, uh, being attributed to uh, some sources uh, uh, in the Taliban, but the news actually did not come from Taliban. It was attributed as fake news that emitted elsewhere, but was picked up by certain uh, Indian media channels and there was a kerfuffle relating to it. So there is a lot of mischief that is being created and uh, the, the, the threat that is, is that the brand of the ISKP uh, it can be used uh, to create fear within the Indian ecosystem because ISIS is a name and ISK is a name that does not require a lot of bandwidth to create a, a separate narrative. Uh, you know, if you bring up, uh, and we've seen this before in Kashmir, where only one or two incidents, stray incidences of some people uh, waving the IS uh, flag in, in the state of Kashmir, and suddenly there were narratives of, of, a, of, a, of a coming up of uh, an ISJNK, so an ISIS Jammu and Kashmir, while there was no such thing. So from that uh, uh, aspect, and from these two variables, of course, ISKP comes off as a challenge, uh, but as far as a direct threat to Indian security in the geography is concerned, maybe not, but uh, we have seen uh, how the ISIS brand itself is a threat. We've seen that in Bangladesh in 2016, we've seen that in, uh, in uh, Sri Lanka last year, and we've just completed one year of the, of the dastardly Sri Lankan attacks where more than 250 people died. So uh, some of the biggest ISIS attacks have taken place in South Asia. And from that aspect, of course, ISKP as well, especially a strengthened ISK, ISKP uh, in any shape or form backed by the, uh, by the institutions of Pakistan is certainly a threat uh, to India as well. Uh, Mr. Sharifi, as you know, uh, according to uh, US government assessment, uh, ISIS carried out uh, the terrorist attack on a maternity ward in Eastern Kabul, but uh, uh, Governments and institutions here in Kabul said it was uh, Taliban. Uh, what is in your opinion? What, why the security forces here in Kabul playing down the ISIS threat? Uh, well, <clears throat> I'm not sure if the security agencies here have said it was the Taliban that attacked the, the maternity hospital. I, from what I know, everybody said it was uh, it was ISK that uh, that attacked. Um, I don't know if uh, there is a policy to, uh, to uh, uh, underestimate the threat of ISIS. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if there's such, such a thing exists. Uh, but clearly, we all see that ISK has not only, as we talked before, has not only survived and thrived over the past five years, or so that it's been in existence in Afghanistan, but it is going to be all the indicators 
point to the fact that in the future it's going to be uh, even uh, more of a, uh, of a threat. Uh, more of a threat, uh, both, all, both in terms of its, um, the increase of its size and uh, capabilities, but also its uh, intentions as well. The intentions of ISK are different from those of many other terrorist groups. The prime example is the attack uh, on the maternity hospital. Uh, no such incident had ever been done by the Taliban in a deliberate way. They, they, they never, they never did, uh, carried out uh, attacks like that. Uh, on that same day, ISK attacked the maternity hospital in Kabul, and it attacked a funeral service in Nangarhar province in eastern Afghanistan. So uh, I think uh, Max Boot very correctly called this uh, the cradle, the cradle to grave terrorism. What it means is that that their intentions are to basically kill anyone, uh, anywhere, which makes it uh, even more of a, a, a larger threat. Uh, Mr. Rossi, as you mentioned before, uh, ISIS defeated in conventional war in Nimbarhar and Tunar, but not, uh, uh, but the government not destroyed their three parcels in big cities right now. Right. Uh, the uh, India's climate again says that they destroyed the safe house of uh, the ISIS in big cities, especially in Kabul after the World War attack. They, eliminate a uh, uh, sleeper cell of ISIS in Shakadara district, north of Kabul. Uh, and they believe that uh, the US and the other big powers, uh, the US and the other big powers overestimate the ISIS strength. Is it true? Uh, I'm sorry, uh, overestimate the ISIS strength in Afghanistan? Yes. Um, I, do, I don't think so. I, I, look, it's, uh, it's not as, um, it's not the same toward ISIS is in, uh, as we call ISIS central. It's not the same geography. It's not the same, uh, uh, the aims are not the same. The ideology may be a very big driving factor, but uh, the divisions that are there in Afghanistan are very different to kind of uh, ecosystems that IS, ISIS operates in uh, uh, Syria and Iraq and so on and so forth. Um, I think in the beginning, uh, there was a lag between taking what ISIS was building in Afghanistan. And if we, we still don't know in a very, uh, uh, you know, confirmed manner what the relationship between ISIS Central and ISKB initially was. And there are a lot of debates around on, on what it entailed and what it did not entail. I don't think, uh, I think there was a lag in the, in the beginning uh, in taking this, this uh, uh, you know, the surge of, of, of the brand of ISK in Afghanistan seriously um, because uh, uh, the, just the amount of uh, uh, attacks and the, uh, and, and the amount of smaller group that ISIS used to take stake of and used to never almost never materialize to anything was quite high and I think a lot of people just got taken, up, taken in with that uh, and that's true to India as well. We had, as I just mentioned, there was uh, in the media there was ISJK uh, there were reports that uh, Islamic State has uh, appointed a, a, an emir for uh, an ISIS Bengal in Kolkata. None of that was true, uh, and uh, uh, you know you get taken uh, taken uh, taken with this sort of narrative that ISIS keeps building because you never know uh, of how to uh, how to deal with it properly. So I don't think uh, they they I think that I mean I think they took it lightly in the in in the beginning, but the response. Uh, both by the Afghan government uh, uh, and so on, and the, uh, uh, and by other countries on ISK has now been, I think, rectified, and it has been fine for a fair while. Uh, Mr. Rossi, I also want to refer this question to you. Uh, at one point in time, and again, says that uh, they destroyed the uh, sleeper cells in Kabul, uh, but uh, we all, but we see the, their attacks uh, in recent days in Kabul. Uh, uh, what, what do you think? Uh, is there any policy in security, uh, in security institutions here in Kabul to play down? Well, I think um, the Afghan government and the Afghan National Defense and Security Forces have, um, have had major achievements recently and also previously by killing at least four emirs of the uh, ISKP as well as uh, addressing uh, or, or killing or capturing some of their 
you know, their some of their intelligence chiefs, PR chiefs, uh, as well as commanders, um, diffusing some of their sleeper cells. Uh, but as Dr. Sharifi mentioned before, the enabling infrastructure um, is there. And uh, no matter, um, as long as the ideological bed is there, the financial support schemes are there, the sources are there, the intelligence background infrastructure is there, um, the poverty and hunger is there, uh, then, uh, uh, and the extremist elements are there, um, uh, then you, you cannot um, fundamentally remove or defeat uh, uh, ISIS. It will always be there. Uh, I mean, recently in the news, we all read that ISIS have uh, started their attacks against Hashra Shabi, you know, the popular mobilization forces in Iraq and Syria. Um, uh, recently, uh, even though they were crushed there. I mean, the policy took um, and then the various operations they took. And the same thing here. I mean, the mother of all bombs was dropped in, in Nangarhar. Um, in, um, and, and, you know, all the force which was required and, uh, and uh, which was necessary was used, but still they keep on propping up. Um, to, address, uh, to address this particular issue, as long as you don't address their ideological drivers, financial infrastructure, um, the intelligence aspect, uh, you will continue to see um, these attacks uh, in, in, in the cities as well as in rural Afghanistan. It is true that they no longer control major, um, I mean, they, they anyways did not control uh, many districts in Afghanistan. Um, the nature of ISIS or ISKP in Afghanistan is very different from the ones you see in the Middle East, which is um, very ideological, very tribal, the geography uh, plus the regional politics that is there, uh, the ge regional geopolitics. In Afghanistan, ISIS, uh, ISKP is more uh, intelligence driven rather than um, driven by tribal issues or uh, by geography. Uh, the other common element, the only other co common element that I see is the regional geopolitics of it um, in this country. Um, so uh, as long as those ideological drivers, the financial drivers, the intelligence drivers, um, as well as the, uh, the military uh, you know, uh, wherewithals are available, you will continue to see that both ISIS rural and ISIS urban um, will continue to operate in Afghanistan. But I see, uh, I see that the modus operandi of, of ISIS or ISK or ISIS generally changing. I think uh, IS, um, I, ISIS previously was very top to bottom, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, very centralized military and security approach is now changing by empowering their different vilayats and, you know, their branches. It's now branch to central rather than central to branches. Um, because you see that the IS operations in the branches, uh, they have increased and because they realize that the IS central is under a lot of surveillance and under a lot of military pressure. Plus, they have lost a lot of their leaders. Uh, uh, they have also, their, their military machinery have been significantly uh, diminished. Um, now they are uh, focusing more on the branches. And one of the reasons of the resurgence of ISKP uh, which many IS, um, you know, ISIS um, uh, uh, thought leaders thought that, uh, and I, I, ISIS masterminds thought that uh, the Af Afghanistan, or specifically Jalalabad, will be the next capital of ISIS. Um, uh, uh, that was um, one of their ideas. So, that, so that's why you see that there will be uh, an increased activity and resurgence of ISKP here in Afghanistan. Um, accelerated by the Afghan peace process and by the COVID-19 uh, crisis. The COVID-19 and the Afghan um, uh, peace process will have an important uh, role and, and will play a catalyst into, um, into um, this uh, renewed resurgence of ISKP uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, Mr. Aryan Sharifi, this is a question of ordinary people that I want to deliver to you. They said that major forces, like government forces are the enemy of the Taliban, the enemy of the ISIL, 
uh, Taliban are the enemy of ISIL, NATO, NATO, NATO and the U.S. forces are the enemy of uh, the ISIL. Why they cannot contain this phenomenon? Uh, Mr. Sharifi, we cannot hear your voice. Hello? Yeah. yeah. Can you yeah, hear yeah. me now? Yeah, we can hear you, yes. Okay. I was, I was just going to, to give some statistics uh, 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 in addition to what Mr. Rossi said in terms of the success stories that Afghan national defense and security forces as well as the coalition forces have had. Uh, against ISIS, uh, uh, ISK over the past several years. Now, four main ISK leaders, including Abdul Rauf Khodem, five actually, Abdul Rauf Khodem, who was killed on February 9, 2015 in Helmand. Office Saeed and Saad Emirati were killed on, on the July 23rd, 2016 in Nangarhar province. Sheikh Abdul Hasib al Logari was killed on April 13, 2017, and Abu Saeed Bajawri was killed on July 11, 2017 in Nangarhar. Many of them have been captured. In fact, uh, uh, most, uh, Aslam Farooqi was captured last month by uh, the NDS uh, in Afghanistan. Over 40 major commanders, including Mansur Dadullah, Ubaidullah Hunar, Ubaidullah Urubzai, and many others have been eliminated. Over 5,000 5, foot soldiers belonging to ISK have been killed. Now, all of these are success stories. But to ask the question as to why all of these forces, the strong forces, despite all these success stories, cannot really contain ISK, I mean, I think that's a, uh, uh, the, the answer to that uh, is not an absolute answer. Uh, uh, in fact, the threat of ISK could have been a lot worse. Maybe it's the, the, it's the efforts of the Afghan National Defense and Security Forces as well as the coalition forces that have actually contained ISK to this level. In, in fact, uh, it would have been possible that ISK pay would have been now a major force threatening a lot of other states from Afghanistan. So, so to say that, it, uh, that the Afghan security forces have not been able to contain it, I don't think that's a good, uh, that's, a, that's a proper assessment. Uh, Mr. Tanija, this is uh, a question of our audience I'm referring to you. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, Mr. Khalilzad says that the solution is political settlement. Uh, the political settlement will contain the ISKP. What is the New Deal's view about this? Huh, that's a very good question. Um, I think New Delhi uh, finds itself between, uh, as they say, between a rock and a hard place. Uh, New Delhi for a long period of time has maintained that it does not believe in any uh, good Taliban and bad Taliban. Uh, so, you know, even if, uh, if a political solution in, involves the ISK in some any shape or form, I'm free to show that it's, it, it, it's not something that, uh, that, uh, that India would be very, uh, in, uh, uh, very uh, will not support it. Uh, I think, but uh, I think there's also a lot of uh, uh, a lot of debate happening in Delhi right now as to uh, what does it mean for New Delhi to not be part of any discussions uh, uh, about Afghanistan. And we know that that uh, 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 India has uh, given full support to the democratic process of Afghanistan. Um, uh, uh, it, it recently congratulated both uh, President Khani and Abdul Abdullah on the reconciliation that happened. Uh, but beyond that, uh, India has been an outlier in the in the negotiations from the beginning. So, if there is any surprise from uh, Ambassador Khalilza that India is uh, not uh, a, a, a very strong party to any of the American outreach programs to the Taliban, India has not been part of it since 2013. Uh, when the initial uh, office in Doha opened, so uh, I think the Indian uh, uh, the the Indian thinking hasn't changed. There have been questions raised on on the Indian thinking. Um, you know, we saw last year uh, the Indian uh, the then Indian Chief of Army uh, um, uh, General Bipin Rawat saying that uh, India maybe should talk to the Taliban uh, and should not be left out of these processes that are happening at the moment. So I think there needs to be a a long drawn clarity in New Delhi itself uh, at the moment before it can uh, jump into any conclusions of what it wants in what what kind of part it wants to take in in, in these processes. At the moment, uh, you know the the, uh, 
and the support of the democratic forces in Afghanistan has been a top priority of India. And I think they've supported it through the hilt uh, from start to finish. And uh, trade is another thing that they have been pushing for. But uh, beyond the point, I think uh, 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 there is just lack of clarity in New Delhi on what they want to do from a strategic perspective. And uh, uh, and, uh, and and whether and what kind of uh, 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 you know engagement they would want to see uh, with the Taliban, uh, uh, even if as, as part of the intra-Afghan process. Uh, you know, I'm pretty sure New Delhi does not want to be in a situation where their first dialogue or uh, or exchange of ideas with the Taliban is when, in some shape or form, they're part of the parliament that New Delhi built. Uh, well, a political settlement between uh, Afghan Republic and the Taliban contain the ISIS bridge. Um, I, I personally think it should not. I think uh, uh, ISKP ideologically is very far away from uh, uh, being in any sort of position where they can uh, uh, be part of a political process. Uh, uh, that would be giving uh, a very hefty legitimacy to a group that is. Uh, medieval in nature and uh, and it is barely human. So uh, I don't think that uh, personally, this is my personal opinion, of course, that ISKP should be part of any mainstreaming process uh, that brings them to uh, uh, any political mainstream uh, ideas. So they can they can be negotiations to lay to help them lay down their arms and re reintegrate fighters uh, into society from an economic and social perspective. But from a political one, I think that's a dangerous game to play. Uh, Mr. Rasti, I want to raise the question of Al Qaeda. As you know, uh, Mr. Imin Az Zawahiri is still alive, and uh, last day, uh, former uh, former spy of Afghanistan, Mr. Rahmatullah Nabil, tweeted that Al Qaeda poses a threat to national security of the United States. Why the United States uh, uh, overestimate the threat of Al Qaeda? Uh, playing down the threat of, uh, of Al-Qaeda and overestimate the threat of the ISIL. What is the reason? Well, I think um, the recent uh, FBI uh, found, uh, I mean, investigation found out that the attack in one of the U.S. air bases by a Saudi national was, there was an Al-Qaeda linkage to it, which killed uh, a dozen uh, American citizens, sadly. Um, Al-Qaeda is there. Their leaders are there. Um, the U.S. national security establishment keeps saying that they have diminished, uh, they have significantly diminished Al-Qaeda's capabilities uh, in terms of uh, planning and resourcing and carrying out attacks in the West, uh, uh, in the U.S. and in the West generally. Um, but uh, uh, they are also relying on Taliban uh, to uh, to carry out operations against Al-Qaeda and against Daesh, uh, for which we have not seen any uh, it, evidence uh, yet uh, as a result of U.S.-Taliban agreement. Uh, the, within the jihadi ecosystem, um, there is no difference from an ideological perspective between Daesh, Al-Qaeda, uh, and the Taliban. Um, so to use this particular, um, you know, dichotomy or, or this particular um, uh, of the enemy of my enemy is my friend and we could hit Al-Qaeda and Daesh and other terrorist groups using the Taliban, um, I think that's a very wrong policy. It's, it's saying uh, that um, there is a good terrorist and there's a bad terrorist. Uh, um, this was the United States, um, uh, mind you and uh, specifically the neocons. And um, uh, when I remember in 2003, when uh, Donald Rumsfeld and the current ambassador, Zalmay Khalzad, was asked whether we should negotiate with the Taliban and bring them. And this is also, by the way, in the memoirs of Dr. Um, Ranginda Tarspanta, our former national security advisor, as well as in the recent uh, op-eds, which are written by former chief of staff of President Karzai, you know, Omar Daudzai, both of them, um, both of them have written about this, that at that time, um, President Karzai, as well as his administration, reached out to Zalmay Khalilzad and reached out to Donald, uh, to um, um, Rumsfeld, uh, uh, that we should uh, talk to the Taliban and bring them inside the system. At that time, they were saying that these are terrorists and we, we do not negotiate with the terrorists. So the yesterday terrorist who was not eligible 
to be negotiated with, and the only uh, way to be uh, to deal with them was uh, to bring them to justice. Is now the United States is um, is uh, using them to counter Al Qaeda. Uh, the the chit chats uh, and and uh, the chit chats within the Taliban ranks, based on various sources that uh, you know everybody talks here in this town, is. Um, that uh, they will not, uh, and, and we have also heard it from Mr. Sanigzai, the chief negotiator of the Taliban in Doha, that they will that they, that they will not use the Afghan soil to be used by foreign, you know, foreign fighters against the U.S. and the West. But they have not specifically mentioned in the uh, U.S.-Taliban agreement, which is uh, public. I don't know about the annex. I have not seen the annex that um, they will take action against Al-Qaeda. In fact, the word Al-Qaeda is not even mentioned in the U.S.-Taliban agreement or Daesh or other terrorist groups. So the, the, the word terrorist is not even mentioned there, as far as I, I remember and I recall, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm wrong there, but um, if my memory helps, that is not there. Um, so the, 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 so um, uh, the Al-Qaeda infrastructure leadership is there. Yes, they are significantly diminished, but they have the intention. They will over time get the um, capability to attack, um, you know, the West and, um, and the United States, um, uh, sadly, if this continue, if this current process continues, and there are not, uh, you know, good safeguards in place uh, for it. I don't know if there are safeguards in the annex, which is not made public there, or nobody has seen it, nobody knows, it's only speculation. Uh, and I also don't think that the Taliban have delinked from Al-Qaeda and from other terrorist groups. Um, they, Mr. Khalilzad and others say that they have carried out, you know, that the Taliban are now partnering with them. Um, maybe they are providing intelligence to create target packages for uh, the US to you know, bombard or attack certain terrorist um, hideouts in Afghanistan. Nobody has seen evidence. Nobody has seen um, you know, paperwork on that. Uh, or not paperwork, but even even uh, you know a dearth of evidence that proves that the U.S. is now in partnership with the Taliban to take action uh, against uh, various uh, terrorist groups. Um, I'm outside, so maybe the Afghan government knows uh, people who are in the government, but outside of the government, the public do not see that the Taliban have done anything significant. Like Mr. Sharif mentioned, the number of emirs we killed, uh, you know, the Daesh emirs, you know, provided intelligence on Al Qaeda and others. Comparatively, comparatively, the Afghan National Defense and Security Forces have done a lot um, in terms of countering Daesh, countering Al Qaeda, you know, countering others. But um, in terms of um, uh, the Taliban, uh, nobody has seen evidence. We would like to see evidence. I hope that the Taliban have decoupled and delinked from the terrorist groups, and now there is a process uh, for them to join the Afghan peace process. All the Afghans would like Taliban to come and join the Afghan peace process, the Afghan Taliban, not the foreign terrorist fighters. We wish that we have been appealing for that. The Afghan government has been appealing for that. And we wish that they decouple, de-link, and take action. And, uh, and we have also heard from the Afghan National Defense and Security Forces leadership, you know, from our Minister of Interior, from our Minister of Defense, as well as from the President and others, that they are ready for a settlement. They are e even ready to partner with the Taliban um, against Daesh and against Al Qaeda and other terrorist groups as Afghans, um, as uh, but the Taliban and uh, but the Taliban have to first decouple and delink from the terrorist groups for which we have not seen any evidence yet. Maybe down the line, in the future, as far as uh, where I am sitting right now, they have not delinked. They they are still in cahoots and they are still uh, working together. Uh, underestimating, uh, I think the FBI investigation into that um, loan. Um, a uh, terrorist um, uh, which, which killed uh, Saudi national, which killed Americans in one of the air bases, should be a wake up call to the Americans that Al Qaeda is there to stay and they still have the capabilities uh, and the intentions to attack um, US mainland as well as uh, US allies in the West. And um, rushing a peace process without, um, you know, um, trust, uh, without verifying. Um, uh, the partnership, the newly found partnership that they have with the Taliban uh, would be a big mistake. And as Mr. Nabil and others have warned consistently, it will come to the detriment of many uh, people who lost their lives in this country fighting terrorism and extremes. Uh, Mr. Sharifi, let me uh, refer uh, this question to you, Hassan. Al-Qaeda welcomed the U.S. Taliban agreement. This agreement did not deteriorate the relation between Taliban and Al-Qaeda. 
Mr. Zawahiri, the head of Al-Qaeda, is still alive. But uh, the United States says that uh, IS, or ISIL is a big threat than Al-Qaeda. The US uh, officials uh, uh, says this uh, indirectly. What is the reason? Well, perhaps there is a lot of truth to that. I mean, the reports say that the estimate in Afghanistan specifically, the estimate of the number of Al-Qaeda operatives is something between 300 and 400. And that, by the way, also comes within two groups. It's uh, the uh, Al-Qaeda, the proper, the big one, the, the main one, and then uh, AQIS or Al-Qaeda and the Indian subcontinent, which is basically a branch of the Al-Qaeda. So you combine both of that, reliable sources say that the estimate is between 300 to 400 uh, operatives in Afghanistan. And over the past several years, they have not been directly involved in any attacks in Afghanistan. However, the Al-Qaeda operatives have been playing sort of like a train and advise role with the other Taliban or other groups that uh, are associated with it. So they, are, they have an advisory role in Afghanistan, but they don't have a direct kinetic role right now in terrorism in Afghanistan. If you compare that number and that role to what ISK is doing, obviously ISK has several thousand operatives and fighters in Afghanistan, and they are directly involved in attacks. So you tell me which one is a bigger threat. Uh, Mr. Tanija, uh, what is the solution? Uh, how the regional countries can contain the threat of ISKP and other? I'm sorry, I did not get that due to connectivity. Uh, yeah, my question is how the regional country, how the, the countries of the region can cooperate and contain the threat of the ISK and other groups like this. Yeah, I think uh, that's, that's something that um, uh, I'm very perplexed why is uh, there are no specific dialogues on uh, between, uh, especially between South Asian countries on uh, common threats such as uh, uh, the Islamic State as a group uh, and ISKP and its various sort of other branches that have come out. Uh, you know, a, a lot of our regional dialogues on security uh, are held hostage by the India-Pakistan dynamics. So we have institutions such as the SARC, which uh, is, is ideally a good platform <clears throat> to discuss these things on. But, uh, but due to geopolitical compulsions, it's, uh, you know, it's al almost always uh, more of, a, uh, more of a, uh, an exercise of just doing something for the sake of doing something, very similar to what NAM is right now. Uh, but I do believe this is a very opportune time, and perhaps we are a couple of years late already, but to have some new mechanisms where countries such as Afghanistan, India, Bangladesh, uh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, uh, Bhutan, and Pakistan uh, should uh, be sitting um, uh, across the table only talking about transnational terror. You don't need to get into other debates and other groups and so on and so forth. Of course, other groups will come into play when you're talking about uh, uh, ISK uh, in Afghanistan. And uh, we've seen uh, links between Lashkar e Taiba and uh, uh, Jaisha Mohammed and so on and so forth being attached to, uh, uh, to the Afghan theater in the past couple of days. But I think it's important that these transnational terror groups, specifically such as the Islamic State, um, uh, and especially the Islamic State Central, and what kind of effect it has had on countries in South Asia, be discussed in a new platform, uh, uh, you know, started afresh, uh, that does not go awry or does not go get sidelined by the tens and uh, 20 uh, dozens of things that uh, usually sideline these debates in uh, forums such as SARS. So I think an honest debate about these issues uh, where uh, opinions can be discussed uh, openly uh, and a lot of it can be done behind closed doors needs to be initiated uh, and which will be beneficial for the South Asian region as a whole. Uh, Mr. Rossi, uh, as you said, uh, that one of the side effects of the uh, 
probably peace deal is the, strength, the strengthening of ISKP. And the other reality is that the United States will leave Afghanistan militarily. Can the post-settlement Afghan government, if we reach to a settlement, contain the ISKP trade alone? Um, I believe, uh, first of all, uh, we have to wait and see what size and shape and form that post-settlement government would look like. But uh, the threat of uh, terrorism and the threat of Daesh will not wait for a new government to take hold, uh, to take place here in Afghanistan, and then they will deal with it. It is very real. It is very credible. And it has a lot of potential to destabilize Afghanistan and potentially the entire region and use Afghanistan as a, as a staging ground to carry out attacks in the West even. Uh, mind you that uh, when there was a lot of um, uh, military pressure, specifically air power pressure on IS Central, um, the IS, uh, IS leadership were uh, thinking to move their leadership uh, to uh, Central Asia, Afghanistan, and you know Afghanistan, Pakistan border areas, which didn't happen for many reasons. Uh, I mean, they, they some of them did manage to come here, but not all of them. Some of their mid-level mid commanders, which many of them were captured, by the way, by the Afghan National Defense and Security Forces. Um, so uh, uh, the idea is, I think, um, for, for Zalmay Khalzan and the U.S. Uh, government establishment is to create a joint um, Afghan government or ANDSF, Taliban, um, some sort of a mechanism uh, and provide them the logistical means, the intelligence means, you know, the military means. Um, to only focus on CT, um, which would include Al Daesh, you know, Al Qaeda, IMU, all those uh, usual suspects, um, the Central Asian terrorist groups, you know, the Daesh, Walayat uh, Khorasan, uh, the ISKP, as well as Al Qaeda, and, uh, you know, as well as the groups like LAT, uh, Jaish e Muhammad, and others who keep fighting here in Afghanistan. So, um, Yes, the, the ideal is the ideal situation is that there is a peace process. The Afghans and the, which includes the Taliban come to re, uh, come to some sort of a settlement, and then they form an inclusive government, and that inclusive government will have some sort of a security apparatus, and that security apparatus will fight the terrorists uh, and and ensure that the uh, Western national security interests as well as the U.S. national security interests are addressed. That is an ideal. End state. Uh, I don't think um, we will we will be there anytime soon. We haven't even started there. Um, in the meantime, I believe what the U.S. government is doing, uh, and we have repeatedly heard this from Zalmay Khalizad, is that they will work both with ANDSF and with the Taliban. And as far as I am concerned, and as far as I know, and what I'm hearing, there is a military cell where the American military officers, together with the Taliban military. Uh, folks uh, somewhere in Doha, or I don't know, maybe in the GCC, sit uh, and talk about these um, counterterrorism uh, activities under the framework of the annex, which is secret now. Uh, apparently, nobody has seen it, and uh, are taking actions against that. And that's why, uh, you know, Special Envoy Zalmay Khalza keeps keeps telling that Taliban has been doing. Um, has been, you know, partnering with the United States to counter um, uh, Daesh in certain areas and is praising Daesh, uh, you know, uh, Taliban countering uh, Daesh operations. Uh, I mean, as very recently in one of his press conferences. Um, so I believe there is an interim measure and then there's a long-term measure. The interim measure for the United States is to work with the ANDSF and as well as to work with the Taliban on two separate tracks uh, to ensure U.S. national security interests, um, but, uh, but stay away from the um, Afghan government and Taliban uh, fight, the ANDSF Taliban fight, and I, this is what they have done. Uh, the U.S. has not supported the, um, uh, the call by President Ghani or the order by President Ghani's uh, offensive for offensive operations against Taliban because of the attacks that happened in Kabul. And um, they've stayed away, but they uh, support the ANDSF on other, you know, counterterrorism operations. But in the long run, uh, that is the ideal is for them to get um, an inclusive government. The Taliban will be part of that settlement, and then 
the security forces, which will be under the control of that government, will partner with the United States and NATO and other forces uh, to uh, counter um, you know, terrorist groups uh, like uh, Al-Qaeda, you know, uh, Daesh and others. Uh, but, uh, the, the, but there is a long way to that and the road to that kind of an ideal state will be very bumpy and will be very bloody and will be very messy. Um, if you ask me, um, I think the Taliban, uh, it will be very difficult for the Taliban to take action against their own Islamic brethren because um, uh, the fact of the matter is that the Taliban lost their government in the first place because they refused to hand over Al-Qaeda leader, you know, uh, Al-Qaeda leadership. Um, and even if the Taliban do take action against, uh, you know, these uh, Arabs, Chechens, uh, Uzbeks, Punjabis, you know, um, different um, Pakistani group uh, uh, terrorists who are the enabling infrastructure in the first place uh, for the safe havens that the Taliban enjoy across the border, then you will see a jihadi cannibalism, an interfighting within them. And that is why I'm saying that um, that jihadi cannibalism and that jihadi interfighting will generate an ISIS uh, version 2.0, which will be more deadly, which will be more, which will be much bigger than the ISIS that you see right now, because many extremist Taliban fighters and commanders will switch side and change their flag and join Daesh. And then this war will go into a new phase, which will be much deadlier, much um, dangerous, and much more destabilizing, both for Afghanistan as well as for the region. Um, so uh, that is uh, what I what I predict that the nature, size, and shape of this war will sh will change. Um, Daesh will become a bigger threat. They will be probably be the main force uh, who will be fighting against a joint uh, um, a joint uh, Talib NDSF Taliban force. Um, uh, but um, uh, but uh, we need to address their ecosystem as well as their enabling. Uh, infrastructure in the first place uh, before we could jump on to those sorts of conclusions. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sharifi, let me refer to you as well. Uh, will the post-settlement, the probable, the probably post-settlement setup uh, can fight with ISKP without some sort of international cooperation? Well, look, one of the main myths about this war in Afghanistan that a lot of people think, which is a myth, is basically that this is an Afghan problem. That this is a war inside Afghanistan and the major problem is for Afghanistan and off Afghanistan. That is simply a myth. You might have recalled that there are about 20 terrorist groups currently functioning and operating in Afghanistan, 20 terrorist groups, out of which only the Taliban, one group, is Afghan. 19 others are foreigners. They're not even Afghan citizens. They're foreign citizens. We have, we, we usually, I, I usually put them, when I talk, I usually put them in four distinct categories. Now, we have uh, the Afghan Taliban, category number one. We have category number two, which are Pakistani terrorist groups, and there's a host of them, including uh, everything from the TTP to LET to Lashkar Jangri to Lashkar, uh, to Harakat al Mujahideen to Sepoy Saba, and many, many others. There are about 12 to 14 of them, pure Pakistani terrorist groups that are operating in Afghanistan. We have the third category that are regional terrorist groups, and four of them, I mentioned earlier, four of them, the major one, we have the East Turkestan Islamist Movement, or ETIM, those are the, the Chinese Uyghur. We have the IMU, or Islamic Movement of Uzbekistan, and then we have two Tajikistani terrorist groups. We have the Jamaat Ansarullah, and we have Jundullah. And then finally, we have the fourth category, which are we call them global terrorist groups, and those are basically uh, Al-Qaeda and ISK. Now, what I'm trying to say here is that this is not purely an Afghan problem. There is an Afghan angle to it. Afghanistan just happens to be at the epicenter of it. But 19 out of 20 terrorist groups that are operating here are actually foreigners. They, for them, Afghanistan is not the primary target. For them, other countries in the region and in the world or the primary target, they happen to be trying to use Afghanistan soil as a stepping stone to stage and conduct attacks elsewhere. So it's just not an Afghan problem. It's just not our problem. And if it's not just our problem, it cannot be solved only by us. This is everybody's problem. Among these 20 terrorist groups, pretty much every single country in the 
in the region and in the world have an enemy. So it's a global problem. It's a regional problem. It's a global problem. And that is also, it's not only an issue of, uh, uh, of terrorism alone. I, what I call it, it's a, it's a triangle of evil. There's an evil triangle. What, I, what do I mean by that? An evil triangle of three things. Terrorism, transnational terrorism, transnational organized crime, and state sponsorship of terrorism. Those three things get together and create this huge threat environment in which every country in the region and the world has a stake. Now, if it is a global and regional problem, then the solution to it also has to be regional and global. Well, I'm, I'm not going to, to, to list uh, an entire proposal on how to create regional and global cooperation on that, but let me point out to five main points that in my view are really critical, that if you are going to talk about containing and, and eventually defeating terrorism in this region and, and taking away that threat, we at least need to start thinking and working on those five points. Now, point number one is that we need to have the mindset and we need to have the understanding that this is going to be a generational challenge. It is not an issue that could be resolved in one or two or five or 10 years. This is going to take some time and we need to have the patience and we need to have dedicated resources and we need to think of it as a generational challenge. Now, point number two, we need to create cooperation. Really, we need to have cooperation at least at four levels. We need to have cooperation at the global level. We need to have cooperation at the Islamic world level specifically. We need to have cooperation at the regional level, and then the fourth at the national level. So number one, generational challenge. Number two, cooperation at four levels. Number three, that our approach to fighting terrorism, it has to be a comprehensive approach. We cannot just defeat terrorism only by military force. Pure kinetic action is not going to be successful in the long run. So it has to be a whole of society, a whole of region and the world approach to defeating terrorism. We need to mobilize all state and national forces to combat this. Number four, we really need to, I mean, it is high time that, that, that the countries in the region and, and, and the world, we need to really have the courage to accept and acknowledge that there is a state element to it, that there are certain states in this region that are sponsoring terrorism. We need to have the courage to acknowledge that and we need to have the courage to end that, to stop that. And finally, the point number five is that we need to work nationally to address the conducive environment to terrorism. What are that? We need to address the issue of radicalization. We need to address the, the issue of poverty. We need to address the issue of organized crime and a few, and a host of other elements that actually create uh, what Mr. Rossi said, the enabling environment for, uh, for, for terrorism in the region. So, Again, let me rephrase that. Let me re-emphasize that, that, that the terrorism in Afghanistan is not only purely an Afghan problem, that it's a regional problem, it's a global problem. It's a, it's, it's, it's a war of organized crime, of state sponsorship of terrorism. And so the solution to it has to be regional and global. Uh, we also have, uh, we also take uh, questions uh, from our audience online and there is a question that I want to refer to Mr. Tanija. One of our audience asked that uh, the ISKP consists from some former uh, food soldiers of TTP, uh, which was an anti-Pakistan entity, Mr. Tanija. Uh, what do you think? If uh, these uh, entire uh, uh, elements will pose a threat to Pakistan in the future or not? This is uh, an online question. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the, is the question saying that the elements in TTP will pose a threat to Pakistan? Yes, yeah, uh, the question says that some uh, uh, element, some foot soldiers of uh, TTP joined the ISKP. Uh, uh, will they pose a threat to Pakistan in the future or not? Uh, well, I mean, totally depends. We, we, we uh, just a couple of days ago, I think two days ago, there were reports of four to five uh, Islamic State uh, uh, ISKP members being uh, being arrested in Pakistan. Uh, now, see, uh, I mean, it's not easy to uh, pose a threat to Pakistan beyond what already threatens Pakistan from within. I mean, they already face a lot of threats from within. It's not, you don't need an ISK outside in Afghanistan to threaten Pakistan right now. 
So, uh, I mean, of course, you know, these are a lot of these people were, uh, uh, especially in the TTP, were the ones that were displaced by Pakistani military in, in, in North Afghanistan and Qatar and so on and so forth, and were pushed across the border in, in Afghanistan. Uh, 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 but, uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, it's very simple with, 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 with Pakistan. The amount, just the number of, uh, just the number of such groups it aids and the number of such groups it festers, not just in Afghanistan, but across the region and specifically within Pakistan. Um, you know, it has two different approaches on two different borders to maintain uh, discord on both the borders. So, um, uh, I mean, it, it, to put it bluntly, will it come back to bite Pakistan at some point of time? I'm sure it's going to come back and bite Pakistan at some point of time. Uh, uh, when that will be and how that will lay out within Pakistan, it, I mean, no one is sure right now. But, uh, uh, but uh, you, you know, creating these kind of ecosystems and thinking it's not ultimately going to affect you is, is, is a myth in itself, I think. Uh, Mr. Rossi, there is also one online question I'm referring to. One audience asked that uh, given to the uh, sectarian aspects of the ISKP, uh, how can Afghanistan and other countries uh, cooperate with Iran to contain this phenomenon? Well, I think uh, the best model to look into any um, Iranian um, um, counter Daesh activities is in Syria and in, in Iraq, where they created you know, the different brigades uh, plus the popular uh, mobilization force or Pashto Shabi. Iran has a lot of experience on uh, countering Daesh, um, ground experience and they have intelligence sources. Um, so, th so there is, uh, there is the potential um, to cooperate with Iran and to at least to learn from them and exchange ideas, views and experiences. Uh, and they have a lot of that uh, ground um, experience there. Um, but uh, within the broader geopolitical um, calculations, um, um, uh, we, we will have to see how much of that would be useful in Afghanistan. Um, I'm sure there will be many lessons that Afghanistan could learn from countering Daesh operations of the Islamic Republic um, uh, and also partner with them. Um, um, and this is one of the issues that uh, I have advocated when I was uh, you know, in various capacities uh, that uh, the region, uh, th this is not an Afghan problem. This is not a Syria problem. This is not an Iraq problem. This is not a Pakistan problem. The region would start, as Mr. Taneja was mentioning, the region would start need to start looking at mechanisms, intelligence sharing mechanisms, joint operations, joint uh, activities to address this menace um, and, 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 and go there. Now, in terms of the sectarian aspects of it, um, uh, the, the, you know, the Daesh version in Afghanistan, it is, as I have mentioned, uh, you know, repeatedly, uh, it is very different uh, than the one in, 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 in the Middle East, um, where it started, you know, all these um, uprisings and uh, there's, there are deep-rooted sectarian and as well as tribal differences. In Afghanistan, the uh, Daesh, what I call project, or the ISKP project, is really a mixture of geopolitics, intelligence, uh, and then flag changing uh, operations. Um, it doesn't have any geographical, historical, ideological, um, even sectarian roots. Uh, I mean, Daesh have consistently attacked um, uh, our brothers and sisters uh, in the uh, Hazara living areas of Kabul and in other places. Um, but they have failed to start a sectarian war in Afghanistan, and Afghans have shown that maturity. Uh, and every time they attacked, the Afghans became more united, actually. The Afghans became, uh, the Afghan um, cleric, clergy, and as, as well as the uh, religious leaders, came out uh, calling for unity. So Daesh have basically failed in terms of staring a, um, uh, a, a sectarian fight in Afghanistan. They continue, by the way, investing in that direction. They think if they continue attacking, um, you know, these soft targets uh, within the, uh, you know, Hazara uh, and the Shiite areas, they would be able to, at some point, you know, stare a sectarian 
war, um, but they are wrong. Uh, the, the, this, this country does not have a history of sectarianism and uh, sectarian wars. But I also wanted to mention a few other things. I think it would be very important for the audience uh, to understand and to know that. Uh, first is that terrorism is no more, uh, we, we, we no longer operate uh, in post 9-11 world. Uh, terrorism is no more a priority. It's actually, a, it's a secondary or tertiary priority for the world. Uh, all the major powers of the world are moving to great power politics right now. You know, these um, uh, uh, competitions between China, the United States, Russia, Europe, other people. So um, let's not assume that we operate, uh, we still operate in the 9-11 world. Uh, the second thing is that the COVID-19 um, world, um, the COVID-19 CT operations world will be very different than the 9-11 CT operation world because of lack of resources, because of greater geopolitics, because of change of priorities. Terrorism has always been historically in the world and it will continue to be there in the world. I think um, that COVID-19 will completely change the operating environment for CT operations as well as cooperation on CT um, um, in terms of uh, resources. So that will uh, definitely affect there and um, some of the um, major powers who are engaged in this um, city operations, uh, they are now um, rearranging and reorienting their forces toward countering each other rather than countering terrorism. Um, and um, um, they are going towards big wars uh, and moving away from small wars uh, and trying to outsource and contract out city operations to private security firms to, um, you know, uh, uh, different uh, client states that they have. And I think in terms of Afghanistan, you would see that the United States, uh, and we have repeatedly heard this from, uh, from our people, um, uh, you, you know, from the U.S. leadership, uh, political military leadership, who have said that they would like to um, uh, bring their forces to the Middle East, to South, uh, to South China Sea and other places, so that they counter China's influence, or I don't know, Iranian influence here and there, and they need their forces there rather than in Afghanistan doing these small wars. Um, so the, and then they would like to outsource the city operations to Taliban, to the NDSF, you know, and maybe to some private security co contracting firms. Um, uh, I, uh, so, the, so we are no longer operating in post 9-11, uh, CT operations environment, uh, the, the priorities have changed, the um, resources have dwindled, and the uh, uh, environment has changed. But in terms of ISKP, ISKP and IS will increasingly become a, at least in this part of the world, an intelligence-driven um, 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 you know, project rather than really ideological there will be ideological elements to it. It will be a hosh of many things, but the, 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 the overwhelming part of, um, of any ISKP or any IS presence in this part of the world will be intelligence driven, will be great power politics using IS brand as a, you know, proxy and as a brand. Uh, in an organized fashion. Um, and or, the, or in sleeper cells in urban areas. So, and that's what I call um, will be an ISKP version 2.0, much more stronger with more resources and will, um, will affect us all sadly. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sharifi. Do you have something to add to Mr. Rossi's comments? Uh, no, thank you. I said uh, everything I wanted to share. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, distinguished panelists, thank you to our audiences. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.